Hello everyone, how are you today? Well, thank you for tuning in to our face Caring Facebook live stream. My name is Ivy and I'm a pharmacist from Caring. So we're living in Malaysia with a lot of good food around, especially spicy food like curry, laksa, nasi lemak, uh, even the mala hot pot. But have you ever wondered when we want to indulge in all this good food but we are worried about getting like heartburn or indigestion later on? So let's say if you have this uh, problem as well, do feel free to stay until the end of this Facebook live session as we'll be talking about the topic on GERD as well as dyspepsia. So I'm very honoured to invite a special guest today, Dr. Alex Liao, consultant gastroenterology from Pantai Hospital Kuala Lumpur. Hello, Dr. Alex. How are you today? Hello, Ivy. A very good afternoon to you. And uh, it's a lovely Sunday, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, we have actually all the audience tuning in uh, for our very beneficial uh, session later. Yes. It's a good day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Doctor, can I know what are the differences between um, dyspepsia, which is indigestion, and also GERD, which is uh, gastro, yeah, yeah. The acid reflux? So I think you mentioned about good food just now. I totally hear you, and uh, yeah. especially in living in Malaysia, we just can't actually help ourselves by enjoying and indulging in all the good food. Yeah, but exactly. that comes with consequences, unfortunately, yeah. especially with all the spices that true, we love. True, yeah. uh, so, so today, I think our main purpose is to actually illustrate uh, acid-related issue. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to acid-related uh, diseases, there are few conditions, like what you mm -hmm. mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, reflux syndrome. Yes. And of course, the other one is dyspepsia. Mm -hmm. So dyspepsia is a medical term that we use to illustrate indigestion. indigestion yeah. All right. So mm -hmm. in order to start our, our conversation as well as the discussion, I think it's always good to understand what's the structure yes. related to our stomach and esophagus. Mm -hmm. And for that, I think we just tune into this uh, diagram over here. So basically, this is stomach, and uh, the stomach actually connected to our esophagus, and if moved out further, it will actually join our uh, mouth. Okay. So um, when we have actually problem with uh, reflux, what happens is that the acid in the stomach is too high, mm -hmm. and then that will actually push the acid upwards and causes irritation in the esophagus. Mm -hmm. Is there any condition that can give rise to all this uh, problem? Yes, mm -hmm. there's one condition we call it as a hiatus hernia. Mm -hmm. So you can see that part of the stomach is actually being pushed upwards into the uh, beyond the esophagus. Okay. Uh, this is actually our diaphragm. So when the stomach is actually being pushed up beyond the diaphragm, what happens is that this part of stomach will produce acid and this acid will go up into the esophagus and causes irritation. So this, what happens is that this will result into uh, symptoms such as uh, uh, regurgitation. So regurgitation means that when the food actually in the stomach go up into the esophagus and then it may actually sometimes go up to even our mouth. So that's why you feel this kind of metallic taste as, of time. And acid taste as Correct. Well, yeah. So this is what we call as regurgitation. Mm. And then other than regurgitation, another spectrum of symptoms related mm. to reflux will be heartburn. So the the patient will complain of actually burning sensation over the retro sternal area. Yeah. And this is actually made worse when they lie down. Mm. Because when you lie down, when you're horizontal, there's no longer gravitational force to pull the acid downwards yeah. and it will just actually upflow, in, uh, upflow into the esophagus and causes irritative uh, symptoms. So reflux, in a nutshell, there are only two. So the number one is actually regurgitation. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have uh, this uh, heartburn as well. Yeah. Then what is indigestion? Uh -huh. Now, indigestion is more broader. The okay. symptom is actually encompass a wide range of uh, different, uh, condi uh, different symptoms. Mm -hmm. So the, the in indigestion, sometimes you feel bloatedness. Bloatedness yeah. is a part of the indigestion. And other than that, you have this uh, pain. Mm -hmm. The pain is somewhere is actually around this, what we call as epigastric region. Region. So okay. epigastric region will correspond to the where the stomach and the uh, esophageal connection is. Yeah. And other than that, you also have this uh, nausea sensation. You feel like nauseated. Mm -hmm. And of course, you also can get burning sensation as well. But yeah. this type of burning sensation is lower down in the stomach area. Mm. So it's the, the, the tricky part about talking about reflux as well as actually indigestion is that they overlap. Yeah. So sometimes the patient may not only come with a reflux, but they also have a bit of uh, stomach discomfort as well, mm -hmm. indigestion issue. So in th that's why it's always difficult to, very difficult to pinpoint what's the area of problem yeah. when they have overlap. Mm -hmm. 
So in simple manner, mm -hmm. when we talk about reflux, it just means that you have symptoms of regurgitation, mm -hmm. you have symptoms of uh, burning sensation. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about indigestion, the symptoms will extend into you have bloatedness, you have actually pain, mm -hmm. and then you have nausea sensation, etc. Mm -hmm. So this is how we differentiate between reflux as well as actually indigestion. indigestion. So also important to find out where the pain is, so it is. It's important to ask patients like in it detail. Is. Because yeah, the yeah. treatment, mm -hmm. that's why a lot of time when you actually a patient being taken the medication already, but they still feel inadequate. Mm -hmm. And why is that so? Because the diagnosis wasn't correct. Yeah. So as a doctor, even actually for healthcare personnel like yourself, mm -hmm. pharmacists, mm -hmm. it's always important to pinpoint the exact complaints of our patient. Yeah. That's why when you come to medical, it's always important to talk about history, isn't it? Yeah, history. So the history is very crucial in order to guide the doctor to give proper treatment mm -hmm. for the patient. That's yeah. true, that's true. Okay, uh, so doctor, uh, can I just know, um, like let's say if the customer they complain about heartburn, right? And also it's important to find out whether is it the pain, is it come from the chest? It's important to differentiate, right? I yes, think. I think, when, so now we are going to go into more details of uh, reflux uh, symptoms or reflux syndrome already. Yeah. So reflux syndrome, as I mentioned just now, although there are two major symptoms that the patient complains, such as uh, 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 regurgitation and heartburn. Mm -hmm. And you see, we use the term heartburn. So yeah. sometimes patients will come to me and say that, hey doctor, I feel like the end of the world. Is it heart attack or not? Yeah. And in fact, I do see patients before that came to me, mm -hmm. presumably it's reflux, but yeah. turned out to be a heart attack. Yeah, exactly. So because mm -hmm. uh, the symptoms sometimes is actually uh, quite similar in that sense. They get palpitation yeah. as well at and night. And they even get pain that extends around their left arm, left And then jaw, they and can't it. sleep at night. They yeah. have difficulty in breathing at sure. time. So how do we differentiate whether this is a heart origin of problem or not? Mm -hmm. Simple. As a layman, you just need to remember, mm -hmm. if you exert yourself, if you walk around, you climb staircases, and you feel that you're very uncomfortable, the symptoms get worse, this could be potentially heart in origin. Mm -hmm. So this is how we actually differentiate between a simple reflux versus a heart problem. Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, we mentioned that there are actually reflux uh, related such as heartburn and mm. regurgitation. Yeah. There's also another spectrum that related to uh, uh, this, uh, heart, uh, this uh, reflux symptoms would be post nasal drip. Mm. So we actually have this, sometimes we need to rule out whether it's because of the nostril blockade that causes irritation of the throat yeah, or causes yeah, any yeah. difficulty in swallowing. Mm. So another thing that we need to actually rule out whether there's any uh, uh, nose related problem. Mm. And other than that, reflux sometimes can also present it as extra esophageal symptoms. What do we mean by extra esophageal? Mm. Meaning that it's not related to esophagus, such as cough, mm. worsening of uh, asthmatic care. Yeah. And then as what we mentioned just now, this kind of uh, heart issue you know, yeah, related yeah, or not. Sure. So I think it's very complex so for the patient to probably fine-tune yeah. everything. But I think it's more importantly, if you're uncertain about your symptoms, just go and see your doctor or even actually go to a uh, pharmacist and then uh, ask them to assist you to dissect your symptoms. Yeah, that's really, really important because it's important to find out the diagnosis first before you actually go for the right treatment, right? Exactly. Okay. Uh, so, doctor, does um, GERD affect only a specific age group? Like, for example, even pregnant lady or children, can they get GERD, actually? So, I think this is a very good question. Uh, which population get more uh, reflux symptoms? Uh, we In recent years, uh, in, when I was still in UM, we did a study to look into this uh, prevalence of uh, uh, reflux as well as actually erosive esophagitis. Mm -hmm. And we noted that over the years, the prevalence of esophagitis actually increases over the years. Mm -hmm. And we start asking ourselves, why is that so? When we did some analysis, we realized that yeah. obesity is the main culprit. And why is that? It's very easy to understand. When you increase abdominal pressure, mm -hmm. the acid will be pushed up into the esophagus mm -hmm. and then make the symptoms more rampant. Yeah. That's why in pregnant lady, during the late pregnancy, they started to get more uh, rampant of these uh, reflux symptoms. They yeah. more get more heartburn because the intra-abdominal pressure yeah, increases. Yeah, Correct. Same so, like obesity also, right? Something like that. Yeah. So they, they, this actually pushes the stomach acid upwards and then causes more uh, rampant in terms of the symptoms. Mm. So the, the symptoms of reflux doesn't only uh, 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 isolate or actually uh, more, uh, more, more appropriate or more, more in a certain age group, but more so in a pregnant uh, as well as actually uh, obesity patient, they mm -hmm. get more symptoms of such. I see, I see. So, um, doctor, with this, right, um, is there any like a specific tools you know, to identify whether it is a GERD 
Is that like a good tool to identify? So uh, I think in recent years, we were trying to aid patients to come to uh, uh, at least understanding the symptoms better. I always believe in one thing, empowerment of patient is crucial. Yeah. Empowerment in terms of understanding the disease. Mm -hmm. That's why empowerment for patient to actually uh, identify the symptoms. So understanding the disease, then identifying the symptoms and ultimately will help them to adhere to the medication as well. Mm -hmm. So I think in recent years, there have been actually a lot of clinical trials and we are fortunate that uh, we are able to come up with a questionnaire called GERD Q. Oh, GERD Q. So GERD Q is actually a good tool. So I think we will just bring up the, this, uh, this, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, very important questionnaire. Mm -hmm. So GERD Q is where the, the, from the clinical trial as well as the various uh, clinical study, and we come up with a certain questionnaire to mm -hmm. aid our patient to come to diagnosis one thing, and then to identify the disease severity as far as how impactful the symptom was or is towards the disease itself. Mm. So GERDQ is one of it. And I think uh, in, uh, in weeks to come, probably we'll put this up in Caring Pharmacy's uh, oh, yeah. website. And then hopefully I we can share with... Even, yes. Yeah. So we can share with our audience uh, regarding to all this GERDQ. So I think in a nutshell, I just want to show you all. Yeah. So there are six questions over here. Mm -hmm. The first actually we look into symptoms differ from patient to patient or person to person. So they ask about this. Remember we were mentioned about heartburn and then we were mentioning about regurgitation as well so these two questions is to find out whether you have this component of a reflux symptoms and then other than that they will start asking how often do you get this kind of symptom and then other than that they start asking about how impactful was the symptom so they uh, do you have any uh, pain and then do you have any nausea symptoms mm -hmm. so this is essentially to illustrate whether the disease is more severe or there's any overlap symptoms or not and ultimately in order to understand more that how does this symptom impact on your life for instance your sleep disturbances or even actually uh, with medication it doesn't get better then you know that your disease is actually more severe once you actually click all the score and then you actually add them up and with the total scoring of points then you start actually looking into the chart if you have actually higher score this actually shows that you are probably having a gut related diseases and complication to the disease is probably higher, meaning that you have a higher chance to get ulceration or erosion when your score is high. And another component to look into is that if you have actually high score over these two segments that we mentioned just now, you have night symptoms and you don't respond with treatment, then this render into you have a more destructive uh, reflux disease. And when you have more destructive disease, probably you need to actually consider getting more investigation. Maybe perhaps you need to see a, a gastroenterologist to find out further. If not, probably actually by uh, looking into uh, this uh, pharmacy or go to your visit your community pharmacies, probably they can each, uh, actually assist you in terms of the treatment of the yeah. gut related problem. Definitely, yep. Mm. Okay. So I think this is a good tool. In fact, uh, in recent times, I think with uh, help from a. Uh, 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 pharmacies as well as GP, we have been trying to utilize these tools in order to aid our patient, in order to help our patient in understanding the disease. Mm. And moreover, I think it also helps to understand the disease severity as well. Yeah. And with that, once you understand the disease severity, then at least in terms of adherence to treatment, probably we can improve on that. Yeah. So this is a tool to empower our patient again, I think which is actually important. Yeah, okay. Thank you, doctor. Okay, so these are great Q questions. Um, so, doctor, can I know, um, like, let's say with this, like, let's say if it's not um, treated, what will happen then? Uh, yeah, so it's just like any diseases, uh, like diabetes or even high blood pressure. If you don't treat the disease properly, you get into complication. Mm. We know for diabetes, it can impact on our kidney, yeah. can impact on our heart. The risk of stroke is higher. Sure. Likewise, in a esophageal related mm -hmm. reflux disease, you can also get complication to it. So, what are the complications related to this kind of uh, reflux disease? Would be number one, mm -hmm. if we have actually prolonged uh, with uh, you have prolonged symptoms such as a reflux that not well controlled, yeah. then you tend to get erosion. 
Yeah. You might and just now we mentioned about reflux, actually the acid gone upwards, mm. and then it will cause burning of these uh, esophagus, and it may cause inflammation. We call mm. it as a uh, esophagitis, and if the esophagitis is not well controlled, then it may actually gone into ulceration in oh. the esophagus. That will be more serious, right? Oh, certainly. So but the problem is actually mm. all these uh, symptoms is that the correlation between the esophageal uh, reflux symptoms versus the finding from the scope. Mm. There's no correlation. Mm. So what I mean by that is that we do see patients that come to scope. Yeah. They have very severe symptoms, <laughs> but when you do the scope, hey, it's normal. Oh. But on the other hand, we have patients that have very bad erosion, we have very bad uh, ulceration, but we ask the symptom, hey, no, I, I'm pretty well. Oh. So that's why the problem with reflux is that the severity of symptom mm. doesn't correlate very well with what we see during the scope. I see. But if I always tell the patient like this, mm. if you have simple reflux, usually with medication, you will get better. With like antacids? Uh, or with, uh, uh, with any acid suppressive medication, mm. you will yeah. get better. But if your symptoms do not get better with treatment, mm. that's the time that you need to visit a gastroenterologist and get a scope done already. All right? So we will mention now, if you don't treat it properly, you will get inflammation, esophagitis, and number two, you may get ulceration. Mm -hmm. And then number three, so when you get this kind of prolonged inflammation and prolonged ulceration, yeah. always use the analogy of like, if you have a cut in your hand, mm -hmm. once the, the cut heal, what will happen? Your scar will happen. Exactly, yeah. scarring will happen. Yeah. So likewise, scarring will happen in our esophagus as well. And when scarring occurs, unfortunately, it becomes, so all your scar are all very rigid, if you yeah. realize, you know, your yeah. skin become very, very rigid. And it's, a, it's sort of like very tense as well. Mm -hmm. So when this occur in the esophagus, it causes narrowing of the esophagus. Mm -hmm. And that's when we patient will start complaining, oh, hey, I feel that something is stuck in my throat. Oh, like the body uh, swallowing. Correct, oh, correct. Okay. So this is also another part of complication related to acid uh, reflux syndrome. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, if again, the disease is not well controlled, then the patient may start having a condition called Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus. So, how do we explain Barrett's esophagus? Now, in order to understand Barrett's esophagus, mm -hmm. we first of all need to understand the cell that line our stomach is different mm. from the cells that line our esophagus. Mm. The cell that lines our esophagus is called squamous cell. Squamous okay. cell means that it's square. Square. So, it's very thin. Uh -huh. And this type of cell, unfortunately, cannot withstand acidity. Okay. Once it's exposed to acid, you you will start, help, help, cannot, ah, I cannot withstand it. Okay. Then the cell that lines the stomach is called columnar cell. Columnar cell. cell is actually like a column, so it's actually taller. And this columnar cell, because it's actually in the stomach, it can withstand, it can withstand acidity. Yeah, yeah. So our human body is very marvelous. When you actually have long-term exposure to the acid, mm -hmm. the cell in the esophagus will start calling for help. Mm -hmm. The stomach cell will start migrating upwards. So you will see that the columnar cells started migrating upward into the esophagus. I see. In order to protect the esophagus. Mm. Well, logically it sounded like it's very good, yeah. you know, but in actual fact it's not. Because <laughs> when you have repeated cell change, mm -hmm. the problem is that error sometimes occurs. Yeah. And that's why in, uh, in, uh, in the old days when we do medical statistics, we realized that Barrett esophagus has a slightly higher chance of uh, esophageal cancer. Mm. And various esophagus can only be diagnosed by doing a scope, also right? A scope. But in recent years, what relieved us is that we did when we did a study in UM, we realized that Barrett esophagus prevalence is very very low in our population, oh. and we also realized that if we do have Barrett esophagus, our Barrett esophagus is very short compared to Caucasian Barrett esophagus. Oh. Caucasian Barrett esophagus usually are very long segment, mm. and the, why is it important to understand this? It is. We know by now, the longer the Barrett's esophagus, the higher chance that it will turn into yeah, cancer. cancer. The shorter it is, the more relief and the less likely it will change to cancer. So I think, don't worry if you have yeah, Barrett's they, esophagus. Patients are safer. Yes, from our this. population are safer, <laughs> fortunately. So these are all the complications related to uh, uh, prolonged esophageal reflux problem. And uh, so the only way to differentiate all this, uh, what I mentioned just now, is by doing a scope. That and then we good. should be able able to delineate and to find out whether the patient is suffering from this kind of condition. Mm, okay. Very, very good explanation, Doctor. <laughs> biology. <laughs> sweating, sweating. <laughs> okay, so Doctor, we have a question from Yusuf. Uh, what are the most common signs and symptoms of gastrointestinal diseases? 
Well, I think, uh, th thank you very much to you. So I think it's a yeah. very broad question. Yeah, very broad question. Uh, but mm. whenever I see a patient, I always actually start to identify where is the region of complaint. Mm. And a simple manner would be to differentiate between whether it's upper abdominal or lower oh. abdominal. Mm. So by asking this, we sort of actually can pinpoint whether the problem is actually stomach related mm. or in fact it can be liver related mm. or gallbladder related. Yeah. And if you have the symptoms that actually touches the lower abdomen, and lower abdomen, what I mean is that you draw an imaginary line on your umbilicus, mm -hmm. and what actually lies below will be your lower abdomen. Lower abdomen. So lower abdomen usually gives rise to, like for instance, all the uh, colon or the large intestine issue. Like maybe it yeah, so mm -hmm. colon will be somewhere around here, yeah. and stomach will be upper abdomen. Upper so, so this is actually the simple manner I first of all ask my patient where is the region of complaint. Yeah. And then pertaining to the region, as what we're concentrating today will be stomach as well as esophagus. Then we'll go deeper into what we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. If you have actually reflux problem or you have actually stomach issue. Yes. I think the other crucial thing is that when we talk about upper abdomen, do not mm -hmm. forget talking about our gallbladder as well. Yeah. Because sometimes if you have gallbladder stone, like for this kind of scenario, it can also give rise to actually upper abdominal pain as well. And uh, usually gallbladder issue will be constant pain. Mm. And they may or may not get jaundice. Jaundice means yellow discoloration of the eyes. Or when you pass urine, it's thick colored urine. Then you need to be very careful. So this is how I think in general, how we differentiate gastrointestinal symptoms in a broad view. Mm. Okay. Thanks very much uh, to you so for that uh, question. Okay, so we have next question from uh, Yufie Tom. Will Kit have... Um, as well. Yeah. Well, the, I think more, although I'm not a pediatric gastroenterologist, but I must say that children, they get less of this kind of problem. They get mm. less of this kind of problem because uh, the obesity is not too much a problem. But if you allow obesity to continue, which the is kids. actually, I think the, feeding, the, the parents are not feeding <laughs> the kids very well. And we do see more and more prevalence of uh, obesity among the children. Mm. Uh, then, yes, you may start seeing more and more reflux problem. Uh, but I, I, I think I, in your practice, have you have any? Um, yes, I do see some children that actually have uh, dyspeptic symptoms or indigestion oh, problem. Indigestion as well. And a lot of time it's actually related to food as well as actually the stress. And do remember, kids nowadays gone through a lot of stress as well. Do not ignore the stress they are going through by our children. Mm -hmm. And I think the key thing is that you also need to. So I have patients that actually, despite with adequate medication, yeah. they still pretty much are symptomatic. So I actually tell the parents probably you need to look into the stress level of patient already, mm. of the kids already. So I'll, I'll, I'll advise that maybe exercise is a good way to yeah. relieve their stress yes. and then see whether it things changes. But through, along the way, we do use medication. Mm. So eventually the patient actually got better and the kids actually got better as well. Oh, so with the, the, I think it's mainly related to lifestyle. With lifestyle. our city lifestyle as well, yeah. as actually more and more burdening uh, homework as well as actually a study. Stress. They probably have more stress. And maybe the food like oily food, spicy food. All yeah, I think trigger. all this, not to mention the name, but I yeah, think you all yeah, know yeah. all the good food that's that we can good, get yeah. and the fried chicken that we can get but <laughs> yeah, yes certainly true, that true. doesn't help and of course all the uh, gassy drinks that we can yeah, get that will, drinks, that will yeah. get more of the obesity issue I think I think from what we mentioned just now good food is one thing yeah. but healthy lifestyle is also adequately uh, important as well yeah because health is still well so taking good well, care of well there's a Chinese saying that whatever that you eat will come out you know? yeah. so whatever disease will come out from there so, uh, so I think it's crucial that we actually maintain good health, good health. Uh, be more a uh, Learn on what we take, mm. but not missing the good food as well. So it's not that we Maybe cannot we can eat. eat in small proportion, not every day. Like, moderate, say. yeah, moderate. moderate amount, yeah, rather yeah. than excessively. Yeah. True. Okay. So the next question uh, by Josephine: uh, Will good get worse as we get older? Well, I I think this uh, this is a very tricky question mm -hmm. because it always related to uh, the stress level of an individual. As mm -hmm. we age further, we have more things to think about, mm -hmm. and then it may seem that when you grow older, it seems like the body is collapsing like that. How come we are getting more and more you complex? Like you have pain here and yeah. here, right? <laughs> so, but partly yeah. also we must understand when we age also the responsibility of life mm. and then the workload, everything will yeah. exert and That's increase true. as well. Yes. And that indirectly actually mm. causes a lot of symptoms. Mm. So pertaining to good, whether it gets worse or not as we mm -hmm. age, I think in the beginning of my talk just now, I mentioned about hiatus hernia. Mm. 
Mm. So hiatus hernia is uh, actually one of the commonest symptoms to uh, to give rise to refractory gut symptoms. Yeah. So when we age, sometimes the hiatus hernia may get worse, mm. and then sometimes the, uh, the the symptoms may get worse. Okay. But more importantly, I think it's actually the lifestyle that we are going through yeah. increases the acid production and thus give rise to more uncontrolled uh, reflux symptoms. Mm. And I think with proper treatment uh, and empowerment of the patient, I think we will be able to reduce the discomfort. So there are, there are a few ways. I think later we will talk about how we manage the disease. I will go in more details. Yeah, but I think definitely. to answer the question whether it's age-related or not, uh, indirectly, yes, but more so because of the lifestyle and, and the stress level right. that we are going through and perhaps uh, because of the uh, hiatus hernia become more uh, severe as we age. And then not to mention obesity, etc. True. Okay, so doctor, maybe we can talk more about the treatment, like, uh, is it antacids and PPI, right, for mm. Yeah, so I think we have made a lot of progress in terms of treating acid-related uh, diseases mm -hmm. over the years partly because we have more and more efficacious drugs available to us nowadays. Yeah. In the old days, when we don't have actually good acid suppressive medication, uh, we tend to use antacid, uh, yeah. sort of like to neutralize the acidity. Yeah. And then later on, uh, when uh, I think in the 80s, we started having uh, H2 antagonists, yeah. uh, uh, ranitidine Renitine. is one of it, mm -hmm. and uh, Zentac. So this medication, unfortunately, is already out of, uh, being pulled out of the market yeah. already. And uh, about 20 years ago, we started having a even more potent acid suppressive medications such as proton pump inhibitor mm. which encompasses as omeprazole, pentoprazole, mm. lensoprazole, rabiprazole and the list just go on and on and on. Yeah. So these are all good potent medications to suppress our acid uh, uh, production and in recent time we have even more potent acid suppressive medications such as wonoprazone that just came into market not too long mm. ago. So all these are very potent medication. So I always tell my patient when you start taking medication in order to heal the condition yeah. or in order to prolong the uh, remission of the symptoms, uh, you need to see what the severity of the disease is. For those with evidence of uh, ulceration, for those with uh, esophagitis or inflammation, mm -hmm. those patients will need a longer duration of treatment. So the treatment duration usually will encompass about at least four weeks if not actually month. So usually I will tell my patient, if you respond to the treatment, you need to be ready to take the medication for four weeks to eight weeks like that in mm. order to have completion of symptoms uh, control. Mm. And why is that so? Because we want to prevent the relapse of the symptoms. Mm. We want to promote healing of the esophagus. Mm. And that will take time, you see. And um, so if you actually responded, then good news. But Sometimes you may have breakthrough symptoms as well, despite already given adequate uh, medication. Mm -hmm. So if you have actually uh, uh, breakthrough symptoms, then I will advise the patient to take Gaviscon in between. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you have actually symptoms at night that uh, sometimes you are already on good PPI, uh -huh. uh, but you still have actually reflux uh, symptoms, then yeah. it's good to get Gaviscon in. So Gaviscon is something like a uh, rescue treatment for my patient. It's like a quick relief, like Correct. after meals. Correct. So it's just like actually our inhaler for our asthmatic patient, yeah. the Ventolin. Yeah. So so if you have symptoms, you use Ventolin to relieve your symptoms. Mm -hmm. Likewise, for Gaviscon, you use of breakthrough symptoms. So once you have been properly treated with it, mm -hmm. then in the long run, we will taper down the dose of the uh, esomeprazole or PPI that yeah. you are taking. So once you are able to control the symptoms, sometimes the doctor may ask you to take twice a day in the mm -hmm. beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, then once the symptom is better, better control, then we may actually cut down to once daily. Okay. Or even actually cut down the dose to 20 milligrams of esomeprazole omeprazole daily mm -hmm. all right so other than that after that then we can use the on-demand we can use the on-demand uh, uh, approach already yeah. so the on-demand approach means that oh your symptoms is well controlled already uh -huh. uh, then but suddenly sometimes because of certain food that you take it triggers again again exactly uh -huh. so in that time you probably take the medication again so but, is it on a, on a two weeks course again? Very good question, uh -huh. Ivy. So the, the caveat is that you don't take for one day because uh -huh. a lot of patients say, hey, I, I'm okay already. <laughs> Can I stop it? Uh -huh. No, I think one day is too short. You may yeah. get actually fast relief, but the problem is if you don't continue, mm -hmm. then what happens is that the reflux symptoms come will come back. back in a few days' time. I see. So I always tell my patient, on demand is good, mm -hmm. uh, but then you must actually be ready to take for at least two weeks. La. At least two weeks? Yes. Yeah. So you take for two weeks and then your symptoms is better, then that's the time that you may actually stop again and watch mm. and see again. But if let's say after two weeks, the symptoms also not getting better, then please come and visit me. 
Yeah, but that has a proper checkup. Yes, right? because uh, yeah. then you need actually escalation of treatment or to be sure that you're truly dealing with reflux problem or not, or mm -hmm. there may be some other condition that do yes, not respond yes, to treatment. Yes. So I think we need to always bear in mind that you must actually have an escape. Mm -hmm. So if you don't get better, do see a consultation uh, from the doctors or even the pharmacies yes. near your community pharmacy. Yes, because I do get like interesting patients come in to say that, oh, my friend told me this is good, that is good, and they'll just take it like this. So that's quite worrying sometimes. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. a lot of time hearsay, isn't it? Yeah. And then uh, I think um, well, we have a very good doctor Google around as well. Yeah. Uh, a lot of patients actually go and Google themselves and find out what's the underlying problem, and yeah. then they start dissecting the and symptoms. And they start diagnosing themselves. <laughs> I, I, it's good, yeah. uh, because I believe in empowering of uh, empowerment of patients, but on the other hand, you must actually empower yourself with proper information yeah and the problem is internet is sometimes the information can be very polarized mm. and when it's too actually uh, stigmatized or too actually polarized you look into unilateral way yeah. and then as a medical profession like mm. us uh, pharmacists as well doctors we are trained to have lateral thinking so we look into things in a broader view so that we don't miss our diagnosis, you see. Yeah. And then that's why we provide you with a proper diagnosis and a pro proper advice as well. Mm -hmm. So going through information online is good, like what we are going through today, Facebook yeah, Live, yeah, yeah. but at least we get a proper information with a proper quality of uh, details of information. Then this okay. will actually ease your brain uh, being coped up with all this uh, uh, in, uh, inaccurate or inadequate uh, uh, information. Mm -hmm. Okay, so doctor, we have another interesting question from Wendy. Uh, can intermittent fasting cause GERD? Well, uh, good question, in fact. Uh, so the problem with fasting, we know that if you actually fast long enough, your acid, uh, your acid uh, component will increase. Uh -huh. So the, the acid, why does actually acid increase when actually we fast ourselves? Because when you're hungry, your brain will trigger that you want to eat something. Uh -huh. And your, when your brain uh, started thinking about food, uh, yeah. the acid will come out. I think oh. in medical school, we studied before. Yeah. So there's a study looking into the uh, the, uh -huh. uh, the docs. Uh, so what happened is that if you provide actually f uh, the bell and mm -hmm. the food, so you train the dog first, and then they measure the acidity production. So when they serve the food, and then at the same time, they bring the bell. Uh -huh. And then they realize that uh, this time, uh, the acid production is increased. Oh. And then in later on, they stop actually giving the food to the dog, uh -huh. but they only ring the bell. So by imagining me, those I association, the yes, the acid will, yes, the acid will come out. Yeah, yeah. So I think intermittent fasting though is good in one way to actually uh, for uh, weight control as well as yeah. health wise. But if you do it in the extreme ways and your stomach is a very sensitive stomach in the production of mm -hmm. acid, mm -hmm. then you're going to run into trouble. Yeah. Right? So also, it correlates to this is that during Ramadan uh, month, a lot of our Malay colleagues actually yeah. come to us, actually uh, friends come to us with actually acid problem as well. Mm -hmm. That's because of the prolonged fasting periods, the stomach is no longer able to cope yeah. with a normal, because normal routine you take food regularly. Mm -hmm. But when times of uh, fasting, you stop taking the food, but your brain is still associating the food with you. Yeah, the kind of food is inside. And, and then the stomach will produce acid and yeah. then it causes issue, you see. Mm. And so no problem if you need to do intermittent fasting, but then you have problem with your acid problem. There's always drugs like such as esomeprazole or pentoprazole or even actually rabiprazole. All the PPI will be able to ease your symptoms and then help you to actually relieve your symptoms. Mm, okay, so uh, another question from Mimi Wong. Will patients who had their gallbladder removed more prone to get GERD? A very good question, yeah. a very relevant question. Yeah. So, in order to understand the uh, gallbladder's uh, function, we need to understand what the uh, gallbladder does. The gallbladder is a center of concentrating our bowel salt. Mm -hmm. So, bowel salt actually comes from our liver. All right, so our liver will produce bowel salt, and this bowel salt is important for digestive purposes as well. What it does is that it digests all the fatty food that we take. Mm -hmm. So when we the bowel salt is actually produced all the time, and mm -hmm. we have the gallbladder is still intact, it will be actually stored in our gallbladder. Mm -hmm. All right. So and then when we taken some food that contains high fatty meal, fatty meal, what happens is that the gallbladder will contract mm -hmm. and then it will push all the uh, bowel salt into the duodenum mm -hmm. and start digesting the fatty meal. That's the purpose of mm -hmm. gallbladder. Mm -hmm. When you have removal of gallbladder, there's no longer a storage or reservoir for the bowel salt. Yeah. All this bowel will continuously secrete into the duodenum. Mm -hmm. And sometimes some of the, uh, the, the duodenum or some of the bowel salt that's secreted in the duodenum will go into the stomach. That's why there's a condition called bowel salt reflux gastropathy. Oh. So when the bowel salt goes into the stomach, 
bow salt is not friendly to the stomach. It will cause pain as well. And I've seen patients that actually uh, with a bowel salt reflux that even go up to the esophagus, that when they vomited out, they will see this yellowish material. Oh. So these are all bowel salt problems. So bowel salt reflux unfortunately doesn't respond with PPI. Mm. It doesn't respond. So that's why it's important to see your doctor. And then in order to treat this kind of condition, we need to give another type of medication called cholesteramin mm. to absorb the bowel. And that will actually uh, greatly reduce the discomfort that the patient uh, experience after the gallbladder removal. So that was a good question. I thought, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, so next question from Joshua: Is there anything that can easily trigger heartburn? Well, I think easily trigger. Well, good food good. <laughs> and too much of food. <laughs> so if you take too much of food at one go, certainly you have problem. Or you actually uh, take the food and then immediately go to bed. Oh, you're yeah. gonna suffer your reflux problem. Yeah. Uh, so that's the most commonest issue. Of course, smoking doesn't help as well because smoking also increases the uh, the inflammation. Right? It, it not only inflammation but it also increase the acid production mm. as well. So uh, that will actually cause you to have more uh, uncontrolled reflux symptoms. And even with alcohol as well? Yep, to a certain extent, yes. Uh, so moderate is actually the way to go rather than too much of food or too much of good food at one go. Mm. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, so she mentioned that when she breathes in and breathes out in the morning, she has pain in the chest. Is that due to GERD? Well, difficult to say. So uh, you need to ask yourself uh, whether you have any exertional, like what we mentioned just now. When the patient comes to us with uh, reflux symptoms or any chest discomfort, we must always find out whether you have a heart problem or not. Mm -hmm. So the best way is to ask yourself whether when you walk around or you exert yourself, you let, uh, go up staircases, uh, does your symptom get worse or not? Or do you feel breathless? Correct. Mm -hmm. So if you do have that kind of que uh, question, uh, you do have that kind of symptoms, it's best to consult a doctor. All right. Okay. Then the second thing is that whether you have reflux or not. So regurgitation, heartburn, as we mentioned just now, mm -hmm. can also cause this kind of uh, uh, panic attack as well. Yeah. And lastly, probably it's not related to all. It probably is just an emotional uh, hikes that causes mm -hmm. you to have this panic attack or anxiety attacks. So that's another probability that can cause this kind of issue. Mm -hmm. So very difficult to pinpoint straight away in this kind of platform. But if you have any doubts, you're not certain, it's better to consult your nearest pharmacy or okay. nearest uh, doctors that you can get more details. Okay. So doctor, just now you were mentioning about um, proton pump inhibitor, right? Can I know, is there any side effect if patient were to take it for a lifetime? Well, this is a very good question, mm. Ivy. And I think we get this a lot from our patient. Yeah, uh, because so, they are concerned, you know, taking you know, this. I think the whole issue of the long-term uh, side effects of PPI comes from an early study uh, mm. uh, that actually reported in uh, about 20 years ago. So what are the possible uh, concern of long-term PPI would be, uh, there has been report that it increases the risk of bowel infection, mm -hmm. such as coccidial difficile infection. Yeah. It increases the risk of hypomagnesemia. Uh -huh. There's also correlation to Alzheimer disease. Oh, Alzheimer yeah, disease, Alzheimer. yes. Wow. Okay. Alzheimer disease, uh -huh. uh, like Sinal disease, and uh -huh. osteoporosis, etc., yeah. etc. Et so the list actually go on and go on. Mm. But before we actually go into this, uh, we must understand how the study is derived. So this study was done in Europe, uh, no, study that was done in uh, America. Mm -hmm. They look into veterans' army. Oh. So veterans' army are those retired armies. Yes. They are elderly to come with. Yeah. So what it does is that they ask all the army to come, all these mm -hmm. veteran armies, when they're actually under long-term follow-up, because army got very good care in American system. Okay. So they ask all these veteran armies to come, and then they mm -hmm. start asking, mm, among you all, who actually takes PPI? Uh -huh. And then how long have you been taking PPI? So uh -huh. these are the information again. Then they start asking, oh, do you have osteoporosis? Oh, do you have actually senile disease? Oh. So you can see now, these so are it's all... very subjective, right? Whether yes, and then it open up for, or for bias as well. And mm -hmm. there are so many confounding factors that can contribute to whatever that we mentioned just now. Yeah. There's no proper documentation. Mm -hmm. There's no... It's just only hearsay by asking the patient how long have you been taking PPI. So mm -hmm. there's not proper documentation on the medication per se. Mm -hmm. So that's why it actually prone to bias and the, the quality of study, unfortunately, is very low. So fortunately, in recent years, in order to actually uh, uh, refute this kind of argument, there has been a lot of clinical trial as well as actually prospective study. Mm -hmm. What do we mean by prospective study means that you follow up the patient from the day that they started on PPI. Uh -huh. And then you see and you follow them out. Yes. So at least this is a good study, although it's a qualitative study, but it's a mm -hmm. prospective study. And there are also clinical trial. The, the, in recent uh, months, we just came out in a publication, uh, there's a study looking into three years of uh, follow-up for patients who are actually mm -hmm. on PPI. Yeah. 
none of what we mentioned just now actually are significant. For three years. For three years oh. at least. So this patient has been taking medication for three years, you know. Mm. The thing, so they actually, so do we need to take medication for three years? Yes, they are. Because for patients that actually have history of upper GI bleed, yeah. unfortunately, they are dependent on PPI. Mm. Because they need PPI to protect their stomach yeah. because they are on aspirin or they are uh -huh. on chronic long-term NSAID. Uh, NSAID is a painkiller. Yeah, because all this can cause um, ulcer formation. Ulcer. Mm. So this kind of patient being followed up for three years and then they'll be given. So their risk is essentially the same if you compare to actually placebo. Mm. All right. So there's no increased uh, risk of uh, what we mentioned like osteoporosis or hypomagnesemia or mm. Alzheimer's disease that what we mentioned now. Although there's this slight increased risk of uh, coccygeal difficile infection, but otherwise the rest are all not evidence. So it's still safe to give uh, PPI for long term. Mm. But my approach is always like this. If you don't need medication, of course, as a doctor, we will advise you to cut down the dose mm. or even actually take it as a lowest dose possible, yes. even up to actually every other day kind of mm. medication. But if your condition actually deemed necessary or deemed needed to mm. take long-term PPI, it's still safe to continue taking it. Okay. Yeah, so it's still benefit of the benefit outweighs the risk of the yes. drug. Yes, so we just need to actually, I think pharmacists also look into the risk and balance. So it's yeah. always an equation of between yes. the benefit and the risk. Yes. So if your benefit outweighs the risk, then I think it's still safe to continue the medication. Definitely. But the caveat is to reduce the dose as low as possible and mm -hmm. perhaps actually uh, duration-wise we make it short and then on demand basis. Mm. Okay, so I have a question from this um, uh, so he said he had met a gastroenterologist before, but it came back again. So any reasons like causing this problem? So basically it relapsed? The yes. Disease. So I think, first of all, we need to ask ourselves whether the duration of treatment is adequate or not. As I mentioned to just now, uh, you probably need to take at least a few months or two months or even actually uh, sometimes even more yeah. uh, before you taper down the dose. Yes. And as I said also, there are patients that actually uh, had the refractory uh, mm -hmm. GERD as well, which may need long-term medication. Mm. Uh, so the other thing is actually whether the diagnosis is correct or not. So if you actually responded, but then it recur again, whether you need to ask yourself whether the diagnosis is correct or not. Mm -hmm. Then they come to the triggering factors. What can trigger the acid production again? Yeah. So there are many, I always tell my patient, there are many, many conditions that can give rise to uh, increase in acid production. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest culprit is always H. pylori. So, uh, although not so much in terms of H. pylori in reducing the uh, uh, reflux symptoms, mm -hmm. but we know that H. pylori actually causes uh, indigestion issue in a yeah. broad, broad view. And so it's always crucial to make sure that you don't have H. pylori infection. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it's actually the food that you take. We know by now, oily stuff is the most evidence-based uh, food that causes uh, reflux disease mm -hmm. and increment in the acid production. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that you don't take too much oily stuff, uh, too much oily food. Okay. And a lot of questions being asked, spicy food, spicy food savory yeah. food, coffee? Yeah. Now, okay. these are not so evidence-based. Mm -hmm. So I always tell my patients subjectively, if you feel that the food aggravates your symptoms, then perhaps it's best to avoid while you're on treatment and then re-challenge back the food when you feel better. Mm -hmm. I am a person that believes in the sense of pleasure. Yeah. There's, the food is always there for us to taste it, to, yeah. to feel it, to enjoy it. So, um, so I'm not a person that asks you to take, uh, oh, you don't take this food, you don't take that food. No, this is not a proper treatment yeah. that I should advise my patient. So food-wise, only thing that I can tell you frankly is actually oily stuff, yes, evidence-based, mm -hmm. but spicy food, savory food, coffee, those are subjective. And then if you think that you aggravate your symptoms, then you need to take it carefully. Yeah. And a lot of time, I also tell my patient, mm -hmm. sometimes you feel that, oh yeah, Spicy food, <laughs> cannot uh, really, after taking it, I yeah. really feel very bad. Then you must tell yourself, you are actually probably have problem with spicy food, but you still like it very much. Mm. Then you must tell yourself that you must be ready up to actually uh, to take the challenge, mm -hmm. right? And empower yourself to understand that if you take too much, then you probably will come into problem, mm -hmm. right? So I think the, these are the food. Then of course, medication can also aggravate the symptom yeah. and stress. Stress, stress also, also. Yes. yeah. Stress, stress is always related to acid yeah. production, lack of sleep, and then of course alcohol and smoking is also not helping as well. Mm. So these are the things that actually render into chronic refractory uh, acid-related problem. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, so, Doctor, we have another question uh, from Lin Lim. After stomach endoscopy, right, if good symptoms not getting well with PPI, so what is the further test that should be done? So, if it's not getting better with PPI, we need to revisit the diagnosis again. Are we mm. truly dealing dealing with a gut related problem or not? Mm -hmm. So, we must understand just now we talk about. We always talk about acid reflux, yeah. but in actual fact, reflux is not exclusive to acid only. Okay. Any content, like what we mentioned just now, bowel is one of it. Uh -huh. Bowel that go up to our esophagus can so-called trigger problem. Bowel, right? So bowel is yeah. one of it. And then any fluid that actually gone up to esophagus, even though it's actually just a water, mm -hmm. can also cause irritation as well. Mm. So I think if it's not responsive to PPI, that would be the time that you need to visit your nearest gastroenterologist to get a proper diagnosis ready. Mm. Yeah, you guys can even visit um, doctor. Here. You have a virtual clinic, right, doctor? Oh yes, uh, my virtual <laughs> clinic is only for my follow-up patient oh, because follow uh, Malaysian okay. regulation doesn't allow us to see new patients in the virtual uh, platform. But I'll certainly we're very, very uh, grateful to help you all if you have any uh, problem yeah. with your stomach or uh, your, your, in natural fact, uh, the reflux-related problem. Yeah, okay. Um, so, Doctor, before we end our live session today, do you have any final advice you have to give to all the audiences today? I think it's always important to empower our patient with knowledge. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of time, if you spend, we doctors spend a lot of time in empowering our patient, make them realize the problem, then it probably actually help a lot. My practice, I always believe in this. Mm -hmm. Medicine treat diseases. Yes. But it's always doctor's heart that heal a patient. Wow. Med medicine sorry, medicine treat, treat diseases. Okay. But it is doctor's heart that heal a patient. Mm, okay. So we must actually understand what patients need. Mm -hmm. We must understand the symptoms that patients come to us. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, we empower the patient with knowledge. Okay. And then we help the patient to ease their symptoms. Mm -hmm. We give them information to cope with their symptoms. Yes. And then so it's not only treating disease with medica medication, but a lot of time it has something to do with our inner side as well, yeah. our inner part as well. That's why I always actually talk to patients a lot of time and then we try to help them. That's why my consultation sometimes takes a long time. Mm -hmm. And I really, really appreciate all my patients that waited for during the, the waiting hours to look yeah. for, to, to actually get the consultation. But mm -hmm. eventually you get high quality of consultation. Yes. I think it's also important that um, because treatment is like a both ways, so the doctor and the patient make sure they agree with this treatment yes. and only they will adhere to the medication. Correct. So I think yeah. it's actually empowerment again, then they understand the disease, yeah, then they, they know the, exactly, yeah. they know the importance of yeah. uh, adherence to the treatment, then only will probably actually have a win-win situation, both uh, in terms of care as yeah. well as actually in terms of receptance to the treatment. Yeah, I really, really agree on that, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, that's the end of our live session today. Uh, I believe all of you have learned a lot today because I myself have learned a lot as well. Uh, thank you so much uh, for staying until the end of our live session today. So remember to like and share this video and like the Karen Facebook page as well. And if you have any questions or inquiries or you have any uh, problems, you can come and visit uh, Dr. Alex Leo from Panda Hospital Kuala Lumpur or even me myself, I'm from Caring Pharmacy. Okay, thank you so much for your time today. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ivy. Bye-bye. <laughs>